Unlike my other videos, this video is not going to be about optics. It's a computer science video. I'm going to be talking about a type of often neglected parallel programming called vectorization. When you write vectorized code, it exploits modern CPU's abilities to process blocks of data at a time. So blocks of, let's say, eight float 32s at a time. So instead of just adding a single number A plus a single number B, you can add two vectors of length A in a single hit. And then through that, you can get pretty substantial speedups. I'll talk more about this later in the talk, but for example, here's a simple for loop written in C that just sums up every element of the array A. That's a normal sort of way that you would do it. Now, if you write that same loop using special vector compiler intrinsic functions, which are kind of like quasi assembly language, they're a bit like you know assembly language with trainer wheels. Uh, in this case, we get a speed up of 11 times for code that isn't really actually any more complicated than that first example there. That's just free speed ups. It does get more complicated than that, and you don't always get a speed up that's that large, but getting at least a factor of four is very achievable. My point is that you can often deploy intrinsics to get a big speed up relatively easily. And then on top of that, you can do all the other types of parallelism like threading. When you use an optimized numerical library, particularly linear algebra libraries, math libraries, FFT libraries, etc., those would be implemented vectorized already under the hood. But here I'll be showing you how to vectorize code yourself because the compiler rarely does it for you. In my optics research, I use AVX Intrinsics all the time. It's a programming paradigm that's a bit similar to GPU programming in some ways because GPUs are also highly vectorized. And although a GPU is typically going to be faster for very large chunks of data, vectorized CPU code definitely still has its place. It can be easy to write or integrate into existing CPU code and doesn't involve transferring memory back and forth to the GPU, for instance. I'll start off talking about what SIMD is and the types of vectorization that are supported on modern x86 processors. But most of the video will be me going through specific types of AVX intrinsic functions, how they work, and how you can use them. And I'd also like to mention here that when I recorded the main sequence of this talk that follows, I forgot to use the international pronunciation of the word cache. Cache as in the small amount of high-speed memory that CPUs have integrated on die. For reasons which I don't understand, in Australia and New Zealand, the word C-A-C-H-E in the general population is typically pronounced cache, and that's how I grew up saying it, but no other countries pronounce it like that. So on the few occasions where you hear me make reference to this strange thing called cache, just know that it's the same thing as cache. I just forgot to set my brain to the international English setting before I pressed record. What does that sign say? I thought they spoke English in this country. All right, with that preamble out of the way, I'll hand it over to the rest of the talk. If you've previously done some parallel programming, you've probably first come across it within the context of multi-threading. Multi-threading is a MIMD approach, that is multiple instruction, multiple data. With multi-threading, you have multiple threads running on multiple processes in a process managed at a relatively high level by the operating system. These threads could all be working on the same task, but they're not 100% synchronized, so they might finish at slightly different times. Or perhaps they're working on completely different, unrelated tasks. That's the M at the start of MIMD. There's multiple instructions, and each worker need not be working on the same instruction. Then there's SIMD. In this case, all the workers are in lockstep. They're managed at the hardware level, in the core of the processor itself. They're all running off the same clock, and every element is working on the same instruction. There's a single instruction that dictates the operation to be performed by all the workers, by the entire vector. SIMD is less flexible than MIMD, but nonetheless, it corresponds with a very common scenario in applications like scientific computing, graphics, etc., whereby you want to do the same thing to a large array of data. Perhaps you want to take two arrays and add or multiply them together element-wise. SIMD is perfect for that. It doesn't necessarily have to be one instruction per clock cycle, as it is in this animation, but the premise is that instead of processing one element of data every cycle, 
you can now process perhaps 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, sometimes as much as 64 data elements at a time. In this particular animation, we're looking at 8 at a time, which is how many single precision floats or 32-bit integers a typical modern x86 CPU would be capable of. The x86 instruction set lives up to its designation as a complex instruction set. The x86 architecture has been around since 1979, so that's a long time to accumulate a lot of instructions. I don't know exactly how many there are, but it's probably something like low thousands. That's the kind of instruction counts we're talking about here. In particular, we'll be looking at the SIMD instructions, the vector instructions. These have been added to the x86 architecture in successive generations over the years, starting with the relatively simple MMX instructions of the late 90s. Those supported processing 64-bit vector blocks of data per instruction. Up until today, where some processors support vector blocks as large as 512 bits. In the 2000s, streaming SIMD instructions, SSE, had multiple generations that processed 128-bit vectors, corresponding with an ability to process four float 32s per instruction, and then with those further extensions of SSE2, SSE3, SSE4, and a few other sub-steps in between, there was increased support added for double precision, integers, and more sophisticated operations. The width of the vector was expanded to 256 bits with advanced vector extensions, AVX, initially supporting floating point numbers and then expanded later to support integers with AVX2. In this video, I'll primarily be focusing on AVX. AVX is widely supported and the principles of AVX are much the same as SSE and AVX512 instruction sets that came before or after it. I'll focus more on AVX over AVX2 because primarily in scientific computing and probably a lot of other applications, you'd be more interested in floating point rather than fixed point integers. And that priority is also reflected in the way the instructions tend to be added. For example, SSE and AVX first focused on support for floats and then added support for integers later. So in between AVX and AVX2, there's also this instruction set extension called FMA3, Fused Multiply Add. And it's used for doing fused multiply add operations. It's called FMA3 as in it has three operands, not as in it's the third FMA extension set. For quite a while, I was like, why, why is it called FMA3? Why have I never heard of FMA1 and FMA2? It's because they don't exist. Uh, it's not like SSE, SSE2, SSE3, SSE4, or AVX, AVX2. FMA3 just stands for three operands. It's like if you're going to go watch Apollo 13, you might think, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to keep up with this. I haven't seen the first 12 Apollo movies. That's not how it works. Apollo 13 is just the name of the movie. There isn't another 12 movies you haven't seen. Just like FMA3. FMA3 is self-contained. It is the instruction set. There is no FMA1 or FMA2. And then there's AVX512, which is a little bit of a mess of an instruction set. Um, it's actually split up into many sub-instruction sets. Different types of AVX512 supported by some CPUs, but not others. Supports a little patchy but it's got a lot of quite advanced extensions in there. When you're coding, you can use the CPU ID instruction to work out what instruction sets your CPU supports. And you can see it through some CPU info software like CPU Z, for example, which is what we're looking at here. All right, so that's a brief introduction to SIMD and the vectorized instruction sets supported on modern x86 CPUs. But how do we actually leverage those powerful instructions to create high performance code? Well, the simplest way is to just set up your compiler to enable vector optimizations. For example, using the O3 flag in GCC. Or in the Microsoft compiler, specifying the O2 flag and then enabling enhanced instruction sets. The Intel compiler lets you get even more fine-grained and it'll let you target individual processor microarchitectures. But without any effort on your part, the amount of vectorization the compiler will typically employ by itself is pretty limited. The next step up is to still rely heavily on the compiler, but at least write your code in a way which is mindful of vectorization. For example, perhaps unroll your loops by a factor of four or eight or something such that it maps more obviously onto a SIMD-like operation. You might have a bit more success with that, but at least in my experience, it 
typically gives pretty subpar results. The compiler still struggles to really vectorize it properly. Pretty simple. Your first line is vector sum. So just repeat after me. Simple for loop sum. Scalar addition instruction. <laughs> let's just let's try it again. Okay. Unrolled for loop sum. ABX scalar addition instruction. Huh. It's not quite what I'm saying. Really? Sounds exactly the same to me. It does? Really? Yeah. All right, let's just try it again. Okay. Really listen. Got it. Okay. Unrolled for a loop with separated memory. A whole bunch of ABX scalar addition instruction. Oh, mon dieu. Oh, de foof. The next step up is what we'll be talking about today, intrinsic functions. Intrinsic functions are special functions that map almost directly onto specific assembly instructions, but with the finer details still left to the compiler. It's like you're telling the compiler to use this specific instruction, use a specific vector instruction, but the details of how to make that possible is still left up to the compiler. So you're doing more of what would normally be the compiler's job in that you're personally selecting which CPU instructions to use, but how exactly to make that happen is still up to the compiler. And then the next level up, of course, would be assembler, where you take the wheel fully and there is no compiler. But also you'll probably be biting off more than you can chew for sort of marginal additional benefit. You can get most of the performance gains using intrinsics without having to go over the top and do full-on assembly. With assembly, you're writing lines of code which map directly onto binary machine code. You have to specify exactly which registers of the CPU you want used. You manually specify every detail. For instance, here we're looking at a single precision float vector add operation. You tell the CPU you want to perform a vectorized addition operation on these registers, vector add two registers and store in a third register. With an intrinsic, it's similar, but in a slightly more abstracted way, which is more like the traditional function call you'd use in C, C++. We call this function, which almost directly maps onto the v add ps assembly instruction. We specify the input or inputs. We specify the output. But the really fine-grained detail of exactly which CPU registers to use, when and how to pull things in from memory, etc., etc., all that really, really lower level stuff is still handled by the compiler. But you're telling the compiler, I want to use this instruction. Make it so. Let's say we've got a normal C loop like this, whereby we're summing up every element of the array A, which is of length n. In that case, you could use a for loop like this. The equivalent AVX intrinsic version of that loop would look like this, which is actually not that complicated, but it's significantly faster. We're using AVX, so that means we're processing in 256-bit chunks, which means blocks or vectors of eight float 32s. Our input and outputs are no longer a single float 32. They're special 256-bit vectors composed of eight float 32s. Essentially, they're just little mini length eight arrays. Now, if I go ahead and run those two loops on my computer, using the Microsoft compiler in this case, first with optimizations turned off, there's a speed up of a factor of 5.2. Or if I turn on O2 level optimizations, which is the highest in the Microsoft compiler, my default C loop runs 1.8 times faster due to the better compiler optimizations but the intrinsic loop jumps even more to 20 times faster than the initial unoptimized C loop or 11 times faster than the standard C loop with compiler optimizations turned on. So we've got an 11 times speed up for doing not really that much in this case. And the fact that we've got a speed up of a factor of 11 here with the O2 optimizations turned on suggests that obviously the O2 optimizations didn't do a very good job of trying to automatically vectorize this code. Now I've glossed over some minor details, like at the end of my intrinsic loop, I'll actually have one 256-bit vector of eight float 32s. I won't have the final sum. I actually still have to add up those eight elements within the vector itself to get the final result. 
but that's a minor operation if you've got a long array. And I'll talk more about that later. And similarly, I'm have to deal with the case where n, the length of the array, is in a multiple of eight, and you'll have to have like a little small loop at the end to deal with the remainder elements. But again, if the array A is much larger than eight, those calculations are all negligible, and you'd have to do them anyway if you're writing a normal C loop as well. All right, so how do we use intrinsic functions in our C code? First thing we have to do is include the header file. You should only need to include the one here, the immintrin.h, and that'll have you covered for all the different instruction set extensions. If you wanted to just include the functions for a specific generation of SIMD instructions, so like just MMX, for instance, you could include just the, a more specific header file. One reason you might decide to include a more limited header file that doesn't include everything is so that you don't accidentally include an instruction from an instruction set you don't actually want to support. For example, using the Microsoft compiler, even if you don't have AVX 512 instructions specified as being supported in your compiler settings, it'll still let you use AVX 512 intrinsics, which means if you run it on a machine that doesn't support AVX 512, it'll crash. I think the Intel compiler is more strict with that. It won't let you even compile it, but just something to be mindful of. I've made that mistake in the past, particularly as there's some AVX 512 intrinsics, for example, which don't start with MM512, they start with MM256, like a regular AVX instruction. When working with intrinsics, we'll be working with special data types that are effectively just like regular arrays with some special memory alignment requirements. They're 64, 128, 256, or 512 bit blocks of data corresponding with between two and 64 elements of integer or float data. These are our, our vectors. These are those data types. Up the top, we've got the oldest type from the MMX instruction set. It consists of a 64-bit vector of integer data. You'd probably be pretty unlikely to use that these days, I'd expect. Then we've got the 128-bit types of the SSE instruction sets. The single precision float type has the name underscore underscore M128. It consists of four packed float 32s. The data type indicated with an I at the end is for packed integers. Doesn't matter what kind of integers. It could be two int 64s, it could be four int 32s, it could be eight int 16s, it could be 16 int 8s, it could be signed, it could be unsigned. All of them just have the same M128i data type. The data type indicated with a D is for packed doubles. That is double precision floating point numbers, float 64s. So there's different data types for single and double precision floats, but there's just one data type shared by all integer types. For AVX and AVX2 instruction sets, it's the same, except now it's M256, and hence there's twice as many elements per vector. And then the size doubles again to 512 bits for the AVX512 instruction set. So in this video, we'll be focusing on AVX instructions, mostly on packed singles, that is float 32s. The principles you learn working with AVX apply to both the SSE instructions that came before it and the AVX 512 instructions that came after. When we're working with SIMD instructions, we should allocate our memory aligned to specific boundaries. So that is, we want the pointer to the start of the memory to be multiples of some number. Similar to cache lines, where the entire main memory is split up into addresses of 64-byte blocks. At least historically, if we were working with SSE instructions that were 128 bits, i.e. 16 bytes, we'd want to allocate memory so that the pointer was a multiple of 16. For AVX, 256 bits or 32 bytes. Now my understanding is that the penalties associated with working with memory that isn't aligned in this way has been greatly reduced or eliminated these days. But earlier on, there were separate instructions for working with aligned and unaligned memory. And those instructions actually still exist, and you can still use them, but the performance penalty between them is no longer there. In any case, it still makes sense to align your memory if for no other reason than cache lines. So typically, I just align my memory to a 64-byte boundary, i.e. a cache line boundary. And that also means that when you call in a specific chunk of memory for your AVX instruction, you pull in a specific vector, you're not going to have part of your vector block spread across two cache lines. It'll always be in a single cache line. Normally, if you're going to allocate memory, you'd call malloc or something similar, and that would give you a chunk of memory of the specified size. But that chunk of memory could start at any address. It's an unaligned allocation. So in my little diagram here, let's say the pointer A is 3. 
0, 1, 2, and then the memory allocation starts at address 3. Or somewhere else, wherever it is, there's no constraints on where that address could be. An aligned allocation allocates the amount of memory you specify. That aspect's the same. But you also specify the alignment you want. The first argument, all capitals align in this example, specifies that the memory address it returns must be a multiple of align. Your pointer will always be aligned to that boundary, which in this example I've chosen is 256 bits or 32 byte boundary, but we may as well just make it a cache line, why not? The aligned allocation function I've used in this example was aligned underscore alloc, which is a standard C11 or C17 function. The similarly named underscore align underscore malloc does the same thing in the Microsoft and Intel compilers at least, but the aligned underscore alloc which is the official standard C, C++ call, doesn't actually work in the Microsoft compiler at the present. There's been some compatibility issues which haven't been fixed. Regardless, whatever compiler you're working with, there will be some aligned memory allocation function you can call. When you first see a bunch of code written using intrinsics, it can be a little bit overwhelming at first when you're confronted with these seemingly unintelligible function names doing who knows what. What the hell is that? However, the intrinsic functions, for the most part, follow a sort of general logic, at least, in their naming conventions. So the naming convention isn't 100% rock solid, but if you familiarize yourself with the basics, that'll help a lot. At the front, we've got MM256, which means the largest data type in the function is a 256-bit vector. That normally means we're working with an AVX or AVX2 instruction, but there's also AVX512 instructions for things like conversions between data types that are operations on 256-bit vectors exclusively, and hence start with MM256, even though they're AVX512 instructions. Similarly, underscore MM represents 128-bit data types, which are mostly SSE instructions, but there's also some AVX, AVX2, and AVX512 instructions as well, which exclusively deal with 128-bit inputs and outputs. So that gets back to what I mentioned earlier. If you're not careful, you could accidentally use an MM256 instruction thinking it's AVX, but it's actually an AVX512 instruction. So MM256 does not necessarily mean AVX or AVX2. It mostly does, but not exclusively. The next part of the name indicates the function description itself, addition in this case, but there's many others, like multiplication, bitwise and, permute, and some have some more cryptic names as well, but I'll leave those alone. The final part of the name is the data type that would normally refer to the output data type, which is PS for this case, meaning packed singles, i.e. packed float 32s. And both our two inputs and our output are all packed singles for this particular function. There's also packed doubles, so that's double precision floats, float 64s. Integers are referred to as extended packed integers. I think the reason they're not just referred to as packed integers is a legacy thing related to MMX. There's all different types, int32, int16, int8, int64. The unsigned versions are also available. They'll be indicated as EPU rather than EPI. However, there's not that many functions that are specifically for unsigned integers because signed versus unsigned operations for two complement numbers are often the same. So the CPU actually often doesn't have to decide. But the one I've shown here, the max function, is an example of an operation where the CPU needs to know if it's working with signed or unsigned. Let's take a look at what kinds of operations are available to us. I'm going to be focusing on AVX here rather than AVX2. So that is mostly floating point operations. If you get the hang of these, you'll get the hang of the integer ones, no problem. Now there's about 200 AVX intrinsic functions. Fortunately or unfortunately for you, I'm not going to be going over all of them. Conceptually, you can group them into these different types. This is not some canonical grouping of the instructions. This is just some grouping I chose. So let's take a quick look and I'll go into some specific examples. First, there's your stock standard arithmetic operations. Things like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. You have two inputs, you apply the operation, and that generates a single output vector element by element. Logical operations are similar, except the operation is applied as a bitwise binary transformation of the two inputs onto the output. There's also some special test-like functions that answer are all the bits zero, for example. And integers have operations like bit shifts. There's operations for reading blocks in from main memory and writing them back out again, storing them. 
I actually don't really use these that often these days. If your memory allocation is aligned and you're using a modern processor where there's no penalty between aligned or unaligned access, it's sort of not as important as it used to be. The compiler kind of fills these loads in for you. We've got comparison operations. So comparison operations go through element by element and output masks of all bits one or all bits zero based on the desired comparison. You can't properly branch with SIMD, i.e. you can't really make a proper if statement type branch because that's not really how SIMD works. You can't have different elements within the same vector doing their own thing, but you can do something similar using comparisons and logical operations together. Data rearrangement is an important one. These are probably the most complicated types of functions. It's where you want to take one or two input vectors and then rearrange the elements within the vector, or perhaps take some elements from vector A and some elements from vector B and blend them together into a new vector. These broadcast gather and scatter operations are like sophisticated load store operations where you want to set up a new vector, but grab or store elements individually rather than as continuous memory chunks. So it's a relatively new instruction type. It's also a relatively expensive one. We've got mathematical functions like square root, max, min, rounding functions. So these are just vectorized versions of this normal single element functions you'd call from math libraries except they act on a vector of all the elements at the same time. And there's also some fast math versions like approximate reciprocal square root. There's data type conversions. That's just like you would normally do in C when you want to convert between data types, possibly include some rounding or truncation depending on what type of conversion it is. There's also some other intrinsic functions which aren't really proper intrinsics, but they're still in the intrinsic library for convenience. So the intrinsics I've talked about so far, they all map to an individual assembly instruction. These ones are actually sequences of several instructions wrapped up together for convenience. So an example is where you want to initialize an array to some constant. Casting also isn't really an intrinsic. Actually, casting isn't really anything. It actually maps to zero instructions. It's really only for the compiler. It's where you take the block of data that you might have been using as a vector of float 32s, for example, and then you just say, you know what, this block of memory, it's a vector of int 32s now. But nothing actually changed. You just start treating that vector block differently now. Okay, so that's a brief overview of the kinds of instructions there are, but now I'll go through some examples in more specific detail. You can go to that link at the bottom and find a good reference for all the Intel supported intrinsics. AMD mostly supports the same instructions. But again, you can use CPU ID to work out what instructions are supported. But things like SSE, AVX, AVX2, you'll be safe. To start with, let's look at what's probably the most common type of intrinsic you'll be using, the arithmetic operations. In almost all these examples, I'll be focusing on single precision floating points, i.e. float32. But it's not a big deal to work with other data types once you've got the hang of how these work. All right, so we've got the vector addition operation. The assembly instruction that this intrinsic maps to is the vadps instruction, and this is the corresponding intrinsic. The first argument is an M256 data type, i.e. a 256-bit block of packed singles, i.e. a vector of eight float 32s. Likewise, the second argument is also a 256-bit vector of packed singles. And the output is also a 256-bit block of packed singles, a vector of eight float 32s. So in this intrinsic, we'll be doing the operation on eight elements at a time. The operation itself is addition, and for each element in A and each corresponding element in B, it'll add A plus B element-wise to create the output, eight at a time. So all eight outputs are available simultaneously on the same clock cycle. Here we're looking at a table which lists the performance of this operation on each Intel microarchitecture. Ivy Bridge architecture is from about 2012. Ice Lake is from 2019. We've got the latency, i.e. how many clock cycles it takes for the instruction to finish. And we've got the throughput in cycles per instruction, so i.e. the inverse of how many times the CPU can output this instruction per clock cycle. You can have throughput in CPI of less than one. In this case, Skylake has a CPI of 0.5, meaning it can output two add instructions per clock cycle. And it can do more than one because of superscalarity in the CPU core. If you think of the CPU like a pipeline, latency is like the length of the pipeline and the throughput is like the cross-sectional width of the pipe. So latency defines how long it takes to get from the input to the output and throughput defines how much can flow through the pipe per unit time. 
Well, cycles per instruction is actually the inverse of that. So it's the unit time per unit output. Lower numbers are better for both latency and throughput as CPI. CPI can be less than one and fractional due to superscalarity. I'm not aware of any way latency can be anything other than an integer greater than or equal to one, because otherwise that would mean instructions are popping out at undefined times in between clock cycles. All right, so that's addition, classic. Subtraction corresponds with the V sub PS command, and as you might expect, it performs identically to addition. Multiplication on older microarchitectures perform better or worse, depending on whether you care about latency or throughput, and depending on which microarchitecture you're talking about. But in Ice Lake and Sky Lake, latency and throughput for multiplication is the same as addition and subtraction. Division, meanwhile, is expensive. The throughput is about an order of magnitude worse for division versus multiplication, and the latency is like three to five times worse. So wherever possible, if you can reformulate something in terms of doing multiplication rather than a division, you should do so. Do yourself a favor. Multiply accumulate operations are very useful. So that is multiply A times B, add it to C. And there's also multiply subtract commands as well, which are essentially the same. Under the hood, this is a three operand fused multiply add, meaning there's three arguments involved total, and the output will be written back to whichever of A, B, or C you specify. So for example, A times B plus C equals A. So rather than A times B plus C equals D, there's only three operands involved. So it's like A times B plus C equals A. So you're reusing one of the operands, for instance. And there's three different assembly commands for the three different output scenarios. But from your perspective, using the intrinsics, the compiler works out which are the three assembly commands to employ. And it worries about all the you know, required memory copies, etc., to make it happen. You can remain ignorant of that level of detail. Similarly, even though it's a three operand FMA under the hood, you can just write your intrinsic like it's a four operand fused multiply add if you want. So A times B plus C equals D, and the compiler handles the rest. So your output doesn't have to be one of your three input operands when you're using the intrinsic. There's at least two advantages of using a fused multiply add over performing the operation as two separate multiply and then add operations. The first is, at least theoretically, it's twice as fast. So for example, if we look at Ice Lake and Sky Lake, Fuse Multiply Add has the same latency and throughput as both Multiply and Add have separately. With Fuse Multiply Add, you get two operations in the same time it would have taken you to do a single multiply or a single addition. The other advantage is accuracy. If you do two separate multiply and addition operations, you end up with rounding errors after both operations, so you get two rounding errors. Whereas with FMA, it's implemented such that there's only one rounding error. You'll sometimes see it described as A times B is performed with so-called infinite precision and then added to C and written out. So internally, the operation doesn't have any rounding error issues. But it's a hungry, hungry operation. So just for the inputs, forget about the output for a second. If you've got three input operands, that's three times 32 bytes. Let's assume a three gigahertz clock speed of the CPU, eight cores, and maybe two instructions per clock cycle, that'd be 4.6 terabytes a second of memory bandwidth you'd need to keep up with the CPU. So if you're doing FMAs every single clock cycle, or twice every single clock cycle, unless the data you need is in cache, the CPU is going to stall if you're pulling it from main memory. For reference, if you've got RAM that's quad-channel DDR4, 3600 megahertz, that's only 115 gigabytes a second. So there's a factor of 40 difference there, even just for an 8-core CPU. And so for that reason, don't be surprised if you replace your separate multiply and add operations with a fused multiply operation and you, your actual performance doesn't really change much at all. It might just be that you're memory bound rather than compute bound. But even so, still worth using that instruction where relevant. Now let's take a look at math functions. We're looking at the max function here, nothing unexpected. You've got two input vectors and then for each of the two vectors, it gets the largest element out of A or B and puts it into the output vector. It's a pretty inexpensive operation as well, same as addition or subtraction. This is the square root function. It's a relatively expensive operation, similar to division, a bit worse. However, it's also got a fast math approximation alternative as well. So there's a reciprocal square root function that's not full IEEE 754 compliant, but the error is small and it'll save you about a factor of three in latency and about six in throughput. Logical operations. These are bitwise operations. So in some sense, it's kind of irrelevant whether we're talking about single precision floats, double precision integers, it's just bitwise. 
But there is different intrinsics and also different assembly commands for each data type, but conceptually, mathematically, for something like AND, OR, XOR, and AND NOT, it doesn't make a difference what data type the bits represent. It's just a big block of 256 bits and you bitwise apply the logical operation. These operations are as cheap as they come. Latency of one, throughput of one third on recent microarchitectures. Load operations are where you want to load a block of memory from the address specified into the vector for processing. We specify a pointer to the memory address and that memory address must be a multiple of 32. So that is, it's an aligned memory load. There's also an unaligned version of the same command that can load in from an arbitrary address. Both the aligned and unaligned version can pull memory in from main memory and put it into one of the 256 bit wide AVX registers of the CPU. Store is the opposite, where you want to write back to main memory. Historically, there used to be a penalty for loading from al unaligned memory versus aligned memory, but looking at the stated latencies and throughputs, that seems to have been eliminated now. However, even so, you should still align your memory, if for no other reason than avoiding spreading over two cache lines unnecessarily. I don't know why the latency apparently got so much worse in the newer microarchitectures. You can see it jumps from 1 to 7, going from Broadwell to Skylake. Personally, I don't really use load or store commands anymore. I just use aligned memory allocations to make big arrays of M256 data types, and then I reference it like I would a normal array. And if you look at the disassembly, the compiler ends up adding the unaligned move instruction anyway, automatically. Next up, we're looking at comparisons. Here we've got one comparison intrinsic, and then you indicate what kind of comparison you want to do between those two input arguments based on this integer flag as the third argument. So let's say I choose this one. These are in the intrinsic header file. I've selected CMP underscore LT underscore OS, which stands for compare less than ordered signaling. I'll explain signaling in a second. It's also the greater than flag, plus a bunch of other options. So this is the list. They're all 8-bit numbers that define what type of comparison you want to do, or the ones you'd expect, equals, less than, greater than, greater than or equal to, etc, etc. But there's also this terminology of ordered versus unordered and signaling versus non-signaling. And those have to do with defining what kind of behavior you want when you're dealing with NAND, so not a number values. Performing comparisons between a number and not a number isn't really a valid comparison, so you've got to specify what you want to do when that occurs. Ordered versus unordered lets you specify the result of comparing NAN. Signaling versus non-signaling defines whether a floating point exception is raised or not by a NAN. I typically don't really worry about it because if I have a NAN somewhere, that normally means there's a mistake somewhere else anyway. The way these comparisons work is they're designed to generate bit masks for you. So if you're comparing two float32 inputs, A and B for example, then the output isn't going to be 0 or 1 in float32 representation. It's going to set the whole 32 bits in the element to 0 or to 1. It's a mask. It's not a float32 really. If we look here at a greater than comparison example, we've got argument 1A and argument 2B. Is 0 greater than 0? No, it's not. False. So we write a block of 32 zeros in that output element. We've got eight hexadecimal digits, each representing four bits, for a total of 32 bits. All right, so zero less than one. No, write a block of 32 zeros. One greater than zero. True, write a block of 32 ones in the output element. Comparisons are often useful directly in their own right, but they're also very important because they can help you implement the SIMD equivalent of branching if statements. Now, SIMD is not MIMD, it's single instruction, multiple data. You can't have branching where you say if then else and then half the data block doing one instruction and then half the data block doing a different instruction. There's one instruction for the whole vector. That's the whole deal with SIMD. The way you can partially get around it is by effectively calculating the alternative operations for both the true and false scenarios, do the operation or operations for each alternative branch, and then collapse them back into a single output at the end. I.e. you can calculate what happens in the true scenario for the whole vector, calculate what happens in the false scenario for the whole vector, then cut and paste from those two vectors into the true final result. I'll show you what I mean. Here we're looking at the result of our earlier greater than comparison. It's a bit mask where for each of the eight elements in our 256-bit block, all 32 bits are either zero or they're all ones. 
We can use that to implement something like this. Let's say if a greater than b, then set x to d, else set x to e. All right, so that's the if statement we're trying to implement. Okay, so we do the comparison. We've got our bit mask indicating a greater than b. Then we've got d. We want to set x equal to d if a is greater than b. So that's the content of the if part of the if else statement. We do the bitwise and of the a greater than b comparison with the data elements of d, and we get this output. It's now filled with zero bit masks in the elements where a is not greater than b, and it's filled with the elements of d where it is. Now we do the opposite scenario. We do a bitwise and not call between our comparison, a greater than b, and our data, e. We're using the opposite mask to before effectively. We're effectively anding with the a less than or equal to b scenario, as opposed to previously, we were anding with the a greater than b scenario. We get the elements of e selected where a is less than or equal to b, and the zeros written to the elements where that's not true. So we've got the else statement. Now we can recombine those two scenarios using an or statement. We apply a bitwise or operation to scenario one, a greater than b, and scenario two, a less than or equal to b, and combine those into a single output with d in all the elements where a greater than b, and e in all the elements where a less than b. So you can implement a branch-like operation, but because you can't genuinely branch into separate operations, it's got some inefficiency built in. Right, the whole vector always has to be working on the same operation at the same time. Hence, you effectively end up calculating it twice and pasting it together. Instead of having all the data elements in play on every instruction, you've got that constraint. So you've got data elements which are effectively sitting idle and being masked out while the other instruction is being calculated. Now we get to the data rearrangement operation. These are operations which allow you to rearrange the ordering of the elements within the vector, or perhaps mix and match parts of one vector and another vector to blend into a new single output vector. But the first one we're looking at here is a permute operation. It's an operation which lets you rearrange the ordering of the elements in a vector in the order specified by the second argument. In this example, we rearrange the pack singles in A using the control vector B which contains the indices of A we want to map to each output position. So let's take a look. The operation is a permute using a control variable. We're going to be permuting this memory block on the basis that it's composed of eight elements, each of 32-bit width. Data type is packed single. This is the 256-bit vector of packed singles we'll be rearranging. And this is the mapping of the indices of A we want to put at each of the output positions. This is an array of eight 32-bit integers. The control variable B here are indices. We can see that B is an M256I type, it's an integer type. The integers in each element of B tell us which index of A to select for each output slot. For example, let's say the B vector is filled with these integers. It's reversed order from 76543210. We go to element B0. It's got a 7 in it. So we select A7 for the 0 output position. And so forth. We look up which element of A to get by looking up the elements of B. And of course, I've shown it sequentially here, but this is all happening in parallel. That's a one-to-one -one mapping, and that's probably how you typically use it to rearrange your data, but it also actually works if the elements of B aren't unique. So that is, you can put a single element of A in multiple output elements, if you wish, in a one-to-many mapping. We might say it doesn't sound that complicated, and it's, it's not really, but that version of permute is probably the easiest, because the control vector B is just a lookup table, like a regular array. They're not all like that. Many of them use a more complicated lookup table. If we look here at the equivalent permute operation for packed doubles, we can see that the control isn't a 256-bit vector anymore, containing eight int 32s of the indices. It's just a single 32-bit integer that serves as the lookup table.
The pack double permute has a single 32-bit int as a control, but it actually just uses the first eight bits. So two bits times four output elements. Looking at the pack double shuffle, it's a double. So we've got four elements in our 256-bit vector. Our control is 27. And I think this is the bit, no pun intended, that's confusing when you first start looking at source code with permutes in it. Besides the long, initially strange looking names of the intrinsic functions themselves, there's also often these seemingly random numbers in the code. So like 27 in this instance. In our case, there'd be a function call like this and this number 27 at the end, or maybe it's written in hex. In binary, you can read it off directly, but that's still gonna be kind of confusing when you're starting out. But at least if it's written in binary in the source code, you might get a hint that you should be interpreting it in binary. Whereas if it's in decimal, you wouldn't necessarily know what you're looking at. Okay, so our control integer is 27. Argument two, written out in binary, we've got 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. We look at the first two bits, 1, 1, which is three. Hence, in this output position, we want to place a three. Done. Next two control bits. 1, 0, which is 2. A2 goes in that output position. And so forth. All right, done. Now, even now, you might be thinking that wasn't too bad. If you're familiar working with binary, it's not a big deal. But your comprehension has probably been saved a little bit by the fact that I'm actually explaining these to you in reverse chronological order. That is, those two permute operations I've mentioned before the permute var 8 times 32 and the permute 4 by 64, they are proper full permute operations that were introduced in AVX2. And they behave like you would expect a permute operation to behave. But in the original AVX, the permute operation was implemented kind of half assed It wasn't a true permute where you could put anything anywhere. It was effectively just two 128-bit permutes or shuffles strapped together in parallel. And that introduced the concept of a lane down the middle of your 256-bit vector where elements could not cross. You want to move element A7 to output zero? That's too bad because there's a lane in the middle. For these more constrained permutes, the permute you do on lane zero, it just does the same permute over on lane one. It's just two permutes of 128 bits in parallel not a 256-bit permute. When they went from 128-bit vectors for SSE to 256-bit vectors for AVX, rather than do it properly, they decided to take a shortcut. They just get two 128-bit SSE vectors, strap them together, call it 256-bit, call it AVX, but in the process, you've really got two parallel 128-bit vectors not a single 256-bit vector, which is actually completely fine for most operations like add, subtract, square root, comparisons, logical operations, all of them don't even notice. But that approach does break permute. We can see that the instruction is called vperm ilps, that is vector permute in lane pack singles. The permute operation is only within a 128-bit lane. It's a bit faster than the full permute on the previous example, which had a latency of three and a throughput of one. This simpler half assed permute has a latency of one and a throughput of one. So three times better latency, throughput's the same. We've got our argument one containing our eight input float 32s. We've got our eight bit integer. That's the control byte of the permute operation. Same as the example before, I've used 27. And that one 8-bit control byte controls the permute performed on both lanes at the same time. They're not independently controllable. The mapping we specify for lane 0 is also applied to lane 1. Okay, looking now at an insert operation, where we want to insert a 128-bit vector B into the 256-bit vector A. B here is an M128 data type, not the M256 that we've been working with so far. We specify which lane of A we want to insert B into, let's say lane zero. So the 128-bit vector B is inserted into lane zero of A. Or alternatively, it can be inserted into lane one. 
that's insert. The opposite of insert is extract, where we want to pull in one of the 128-bit lanes out of the 256-bit vector A. Same logic applies. We indicate which of the two lanes we want to extract. Another important operation is a blend, and it's also a pretty fast operation. You can see the throughput there is three instructions per cycle and latency of one. This is where we want to mix and match the elements of A and B. So it's a mashup of the A and B vectors. We've got our 8-bit control for a set of eight packed singles. Bit zero of the control says A. Bit one of the control says B, and so forth. There's only eight output slots, folks. Which elements of A and B will make it into the final output vector? Only the control byte can decide. Gather operation. So gather operation is a relatively new operation. It only came into being with AVX2, and the opposite of gather, the scatter, didn't come in until AVX512. So this is for a scenario where we want to pull in individual elements from all different places in memory and assemble them into a single vector A. It's a relatively slow operation, but I don't know exactly how slow. I'm guessing it's probably variable depending on the details. Some other gather operations, but not this one specifically, are listed as having latencies of 17 and CPIs of 5. The first argument gives us the base address of main memory from which all the other parameters will be defined. So that's the memory offset for everything else, the start of the array. Next parameter is an array of indices. It's a 256-bit vector of 8 int 32s, which tells us the index of each element of our main memory array, which starts at the base address. Those are the indices of the array we want to gather. The next tells us what to multiply the indices by to get a memory address offset. And that will be added on top of the base address. So for float 32, that would be four bytes. All up, we're going to be gathering in floats from the memory addresses of the source address plus the indices times the scale. That's the memory addresses of the floats we want. And we'll be pulling them all into our output vector, which I've labeled A. So look at this example, we've got indices 2, 12, 6, 8, 10, 4, 17, and 0. First element 2 multiply by the scale 4, that's a memory address of 8. The float 32 at that address will be the first element in the output vector. Next, index times scale, get the address, etc, etc. There's also some operations that can work horizontally as well. So that is, instead of adding elements vertically, i.e. adding A0 to B0, there's some that can do operations between elements within the same vector. Horizontal add is an example of that, and it's often handy. It works like this. It's kind of a funny mapping, and it's an inline operation. We add adjacent elements of A, put them in the output. Add adjacent elements of B, put them in the output. And you end up with this kind of interlaced output where you've got A1 plus A0, A3 plus A2, then B1 plus B0, then b3 plus b2. Two sums of a, then two sums of b, then two sums of a, then two sums of b. Here we've got data type conversions. For example, converting an int32 to a float32, or the other way around, float32 to int32, or float32 to float64, which is a bit slower. There's also operations for converting between different types of integers, all of these aren't particularly expensive operations, but it is worth remembering that they're not free either. And the final intrinsic function I'll mention is a kind of fake intrinsic, like a pseudo intrinsic, but it is a useful one. All the intrinsics I've mentioned so far have a corresponding single assembly instruction. However, there's also a few pseudo intrinsics that map onto short sequences of assembly instructions. So they're still very useful, but you know, just remember that they're not real intrinsics in that sense. Probably the one you'd use the most are the set intrinsics, where you want to initialize a new vector with some values. You could create a float array and then load it in, but you can also use these set functions. This one initializes an eight vector of float 32s, where you specify each of the eight individual elements. Notice that it's written right to left, so the zeroth element is the last argument to the function, not the first. There's also the set one version where you want to specify a single input value 
and the intrinsic will put it in all the elements of the vector. So useful for setting it to, say, zero or a constant. In this next section, I'll do a little demo of calculating the complex dot product of two arrays using intrinsics. And hopefully in this demo, we can show off a couple of the different aspects that we've just seen. And this should give you a little bit of a taste of how you use these. We're doing the complex dot product, so we've got two arrays, A and B, which are complex numbers, and we want to multiply each element of A by the conjugate of each corresponding element of B, and then sum up all of those products to get the final complex dot product result. That result will have a real component and will have an imaginary component. First thing we'll need is the headers. I've included IO stream for writing to the console. I've got the C standard library. I didn't actually have to include that in my case, it compiled without it, but the standard C random number generator is in there and I'll be using that to initialize my array. So it's still in this demo, but it's not really the point of this demo. It's just in there to initialize the arrays. We've got the all important intrinsic header file itself, which is sort of the main header we need for this demonstration. And I've also got the standard C++ timing header in there for profiling the code. Now for the main function, the only function this program has actually, I'm gonna be making an array with two to the power of 26 float 32s in it. So about 67 million floats. There's no significance to that number other than the fact that it's relatively large. Large enough that it takes long enough for the timers to be accurate and large enough that it doesn't fit in CPU cache. It's also a multiple of eight, which means our 256-bit vectors will fit exactly into an array of that size. And for this demo, we'll just ignore dealing with the remainder elements if there were any, but there is no remainders in this case because it all fits in perfectly. We're working with complex numbers, so there will be roughly 67 million total float 32s in the array, but only half that number of complex numbers because each complex number is composed of two float 32s, one for the real component, one for the imaginary component, and they'll be organized in memory in an interlaced fashion, which is the normal way that uh, complex numbers are usually stored in memory, as opposed to real and imaginary components in separate arrays, which you can also do. I do an aligned memory allocation for my arrays, A and B. These are the two arrays I'll be doing the dot product between. I allocate n elements worth of float 32s, and I align the memory to a cache line boundary. So this will mean that none of my 256-bit vectors will be hanging between two cache lines. I could also have just aligned it to a 32-byte 256-bit boundary. It wouldn't really make any difference for an array this large. If the whole array was only 5, 12 bits long, only 64 bytes long, then you could get some advantage due to the fact that the whole array would fit in a cache line. Anyways, so I fill the array of A and B with a bunch of random numbers between minus one and plus one, but it doesn't really matter what I'm filling it with. It's just random data. First, we'll take a look at the normal scalar implementation where you just use a regular for loop and regular addition and multiplication operations. We start the timer, initialize the real and imaginary components of our sum tally. These are the variables where we'll be adding the products of A and conjugate B along the way. This is where we'll be accumulating our result in these two variables. We enter the loop. We'll be going two indices per loop, so that is we'll be going one complex number pair per iteration. We get the real and imaginary components of A. We get the real and imaginary components of B, except I've conjugated the imaginary component of B. And then I've done the complex multiply between them. CR is the real part, CI is the imaginary part. The real part is composed of the real parts squared minus the imaginary part squared. The imaginary part is composed of the sum of the real part of one multiplied by the complex part of the other. That's just the normal way you multiply two complex numbers. Then I add those product results to the sum for both the real and imaginary components. Stop the timer, calculate the runtime, print out the result. Now let's take a look at the vectorized version of the same routine. Start the timer. Initialize the real and imaginary components of our sum to all zeros in all eight elements of each of our two 256-bit vectors using the set one pseudo intrinsic. So now sum r and sum i are both filled of just blocks of eight float 32s that are set to zero. We'll also set up a vector that's composed of elements alternating 
minus one in the imaginary slots and plus one in the real slots. And we'll be using this to conjugate the complex numbers. I'll also alias the float32 array as a 256-bit vector array. So now I can address the individual 256-bit vectors of the array A. You could also use the load intrinsic inside the loop to load in values of capital A and capital B into 256-bit vectors. That would also work. But I like to set it up like this, and then I can just treat lowercase a and lowercase b like you would normally treat an array. But you index into it now as an array of vectors rather than an array of float32s. This is the total length of the A and B arrays in terms of 256-bit vectors. So the vector length here is 8. So there's 8 float 32s per 256-bit vector. We've just got the float 32 length of the array divided by the vector length, which is 8. Now we enter the loop. First line, multiply A times B. So that'll give us an output vector like so where the even elements are the two real components multiplied together, and the odd elements are the two imaginary components multiplied together, which is what we need for the real component of our dot product sum. Then we'll conjugate B by multiplying it by that conj vector we created before that was filled with alternating minus one, one, minus one, one values in the imaginary and real spots respectively. Multiply it like this. Then we multiply them together. Now we've got the complex conjugate vector of B with the sign flipped on every second element corresponding to the imaginary components. Next, we get to the permute. What I want to do here is I want to use the permute to flip the real and imaginary components. I want to flip those real and imaginary components within the vector so that later I can multiply real components with imaginary components. And to do that, I'll use this in-lane permute. I don't need to cross lanes for this kind of pairwise swap. Permute is set up like so. We've got conjugate B, and now we want to flip the real and imaginary components, and the control byte is set up to do that pairwise flip operation for us. The first two bits indicate we should assign element one to output zero. Second two bits indicate element zero to output one. Third two bits indicate element three to output two. Final two bits indicate element two to output three. Now we multiply that result. So the conjugate of B with the real and imaginary components flipped, we multiply that with A. And we get this result. The real parts of A multiplied by the imaginary components of B and the real parts of B multiplied by the imaginary components of A. So this is the imaginary component of our dot product sum, ci. And then we vector add those to the running tally of some real and some imaginary. Rather than doing separate multiply and then addition operations, we can also do the same thing using the fused multiply add. The multiply add used for the real component of the sum tally and the multiply add for the imaginary component of the sum tally. In this case, it's probably not really gonna make any difference performance wise because we're gonna be memory bound for a loop like this. But we may as well use the FMA if we're confident we're running on a CPU that supports it. Now we reach the end of the loop and we've got our real and imaginary components of our sum. So we're almost there. But at the moment, the total sum isn't quite complete because we still have to add up those eight elements within the sum R and sum I vectors. We've done most of the summing, but not that last little block of eight. So here I've created an alias of the 256-bit vector as a float array pointer. So now we can address our 256-bit vector as if it was a normal float32 array. The lazy way to do the final summation would just be to add up all eight elements of the real and imaginary arrays like so. Element 0, plus 1, plus 2, plus 3, plus 4, plus 5, plus 6, plus 7. Done. And if the array is big, you know, you've just iterated over 60 million or something elements. This last summation of eight is kind of trivial, but you can also do it properly using intrinsics with horizontal summations. The idea here is you keep summing up adjacent elements using the horizontal add intrinsic. You do a lane flip using a permute, and then you sum the flipped and unflipped versions together. And then you'll end up with a vector that's got the sum of the entire original eight vector in every element. It goes like this. First, we do horizontal add of A with A, 
and we get this. So this gives us the sum of the two adjacent elements in the vector. So we've gone from a vector of eight to effectively a vector of four now. You can see the same values are duplicated twice. There's only really four elements of non-redundant data in there. And then we call it on itself again. Now we've got the elements filled with the sum of the entire lane. So that is, it's filled with the sum of four adjacent elements from the original vector. And now we have to deal with that lane in the middle. So we can use a permute operation. So this is a 128-bit permute that swaps lanes. Now we've got two versions of the summation, the original, plus a version with the lanes swapped. And then we sum those together. And now we've got every element of the output vector filled with the sum of every element of the original vector. So we've collapsed it all horizontally and summed up every element. Overall for the scalar approach versus the vectorized approach, with the compiler optimizations turned on, I got a speed up of almost exactly four times. Your results may differ, but a factor of four is not an unrealistic number to expect. Okay, and that's it. Thanks for listening. Hopefully that's a helpful introduction to using intrinsic functions to utilize SIMD in your coding. Of course, SIMD is just one type of parallelism, and you can also use these techniques on top of other things like multi-threading to potentially get even larger speedups.